Okay, so, uh, welcome everyone to the, to the final session and the end ultimate presentation of the conference. Uh, so our first speaker for the section for the session is how we are going to be discussing the probabilistic nature of the field of time as a dynamic variable. So good afternoon, my name is Hao Yao. So we are almost coming to the end of the conference, but before we do that, let's take a look at something a little bit different from what we have been in, uh, uh, hearing so far. We'll take a look at the, some fundamental questions in physics and also quantum theory. And then we will we'll propose a model that we think can have an application to the quantum cognition. Now, this is just my abstract of uh, what I've submitted into, uh, for, for, for peer review. And so, if we're looking at fundamental questions in physics or in quantum theory, one of the most popular uh, questions that will pop up to our mind probably will be the nature of time. How time is treated in a quantum field or a classical field. So, Typically, in a classical field and in a quantum field, time is a parameter. It's not a, a dynamical variable. It can be used only for reference to measure what's happening inside a matter field. Now, on the other hand, if we look at relativity, space and time are weaved as unity. Time in relativity actually is dynamical. It's very, I mean, it's very different from what, how it is treated in quantum mechanics or even in any classical field. Now, there are also, I mean, recently, there are some suggestions that time should be treated in a more similar footing with space. And those include examples like quantum tunneling, like decay of particles, uh, and such and such. So can time has a more dynamical role? And if we look at a very simple example, let, let's look at a pendulum. A pendulum is oscillation in space. So we, we, we know it's, it's a very familiar uh, concept that things can move in space. But how about if matter can also go oscillation in time? And if there are oscillations in time, what kind of property we can get? So remember when, when Maxwell, he unified the electromagnetic field. He introduced a symmetry to the field. And he got a lot of amaz uh, uh, amazing results. And so by doing this, we will we'll try if we can restore symmetry between time and space in the matter field. So what can we get? And then at the end, we want to uh, see the model that we have developed. Can there be any application to quantum cognition? Now, the key results, just uh, gen uh, generally summarize the results that we have. We, the model that we develop can reconcile the basic properties of a non-interacting silver spin bosonic field. And because it satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation, it also satisfies the Schrodinger equation. And in such a case, we can develop the properties of a quantum field even in the non-relativistic Level, which we can apply to quantum cognition. Time in this model has a more dynamical or, uh, or role. And it may open some mathematical or uh, uh, formulation that we may be able to apply also outside the uh, physics. Next, we will establish a mass proper time uncertainty relation, which is important in any, any quantum theory. And Oscillation of time can be a self-adjoint operator. It is something different from what Pauli has suggested. And we will show that Pauli, what Pauli, Pauli suggests that time cannot be an operator. And we want to show that in this model, it will not be an issue. And then uh, finally, we will discuss the application that we believe can be applied outside uh, quantum mechanics. So let us take a look at very, something very simple, even in classical theory. We have a background coordinate, Tx, in an inertial frame uh, O. And in time, typically, it's just a parameter. It 
used to measure all, or it's a reference measuring all the oscillation or movement in the, in the man wave. So if it is a classical wave, the amplitude of that uh, oscillation, like say x, it's well defined. We, we, we know that it's just the, uh, the uh, difference of the maximum displacement from its equilibrium position. Now, if we look at time the same way, we can define the amplitude of the time oscillation t as the maximum difference between time of matter inside the wave, which we call it tf, and the external time t. So, now, to, to define that balance, we will imagine we have an, obs a, a, an observer far away at spatial infinity, far away. It will be just a reference that we will use. And also inside the matter, in the, in the matter field, the time inside this matter field, will, the, bear, the rate of this oscillation will vary. So, so it's not exactly like when we think of special relativity. When, when um, an observer traveling at a velocity, the time rate will change. But in this case, we introduce an additional degree of freedom, which will allow that time rate to change inside the mass as well. And we would want to see how it will, what kind of properties will, will give, give it to us. Now, in here, we'll define a four vector. This is an amplitude that we use to describe the oscillation in time and space, which is related to something very similar that we can see from spatial relativity. It relates to the amplitude in, in, in proper time, which is T0. Now, we can write down a very simple equation of the oscillation in time. Tf in here is just the, the time inside the wave. Xf is the time, uh, is the spatial displacement in, in the wave. Now you can see how simple equation two is. This is just typically what we see in the classical field. But now we introduce another additional degree of freedom, which allows time to oscillate. And in here, see the t is just an exponential function that will describe the oscillations in time and space. Now, by looking at those two equations, these two equations, three and four, we can further define a plane wave theta, such that theta t and theta x, which is the oscillation in time and space, will be the derivative in respect to time and space. And so, the vibrations of matter in this space and time wave can be described by one single or plane wave theta. And now, let's consider a box. A box with a volume V, which is a cube, and there are many particles inside. It can be just like oxidative. Just like uh, if we look at a quantum system with a box and, and see what's in there. But however, we do not know whether, whether that field is a quantized field or not. We can, it can be treated as classical. And we will make the answer that phi, that phi, phi in here can be defined related to C. And, but so far, so far what we see is this all the mathematical formulation can be applied to a classical field. It doesn't have to be quantum. We didn't say that whether this field are quantized yet. And by doing that, we can apply later on to something that happens to our within our brain, that the, our brain is a classical object, that the formulation inside the brain could be able to be applied by uh, using a classical field in terms of a side uh, of a phi in here. Now, if we look at equation 8 and 9, it satisfies the equation of uh, motion. And this equation of motion actually has the exact form as klein gordon equation. But however, we are still talking about could be a classical field. If we do not know whether that field is quantized or not. And by looking at the equation of motion, we can get the Hamiltonian, de de uh, Hamiltonian density equation in 11. And we'll look at each term of it and see what's, what it is in here. I'll try to summarize the results so, so we won't have to go through all the detail or everybody will be falling asleep <laughs> in the afternoon after lunch. And so if we look at um, the Hamiltonian density on the right-hand side, the first Hamiltonian actually is related to the energy related to energy of the oscillation in time. You see that, that this is the amplitude of time. And this term in here in front are just the oscillation, the term that we see for a typical classical oscillator. The second 
term in the Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian equation is related to the energy of oscillation in space, which is amplitude x. The third one is just the amplitude of the proper time. So after we combine all of these, we get the final equation of, of h plus in here. Now, let's consider something that without the oscillation in both space and time, and with just only time, because this is something that very, I mean, it's more important to look at, because somehow if we look at this system, we can tell that this system has to be quantized. And the plane wave, the, the plane wave that we have, will have to be given by equation 16 and 17. The energy, the Hamiltonian, actually inside this cube with 4 mv, is given by e uh, equation 18. So if we look at the denominator in here, this is only oscillation in proper time. And since so far in this box, we have only considered the energy of mass. We haven't considered any other field or any other charge. So what's, what kind of energy we will have inside this box? This box, what it has is only the energy of the mass of the matter. And so by doing that, we can consider this E is the energy of the matter. So it is an internal energy with this oscillation will generate the energy of the mass. And so next, we will look at, we will think of something very simple in, 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 in um, uh, spectral relativity. Mass is on shell, E equals to mc squared. That, that's a mass. And in here, we, know, we, we show that the energy, this energy, will be generated by the oscillation in time. So not only it has internal energy, a mass will have also oscillation in time. We obtain this by restoring the symmetry between time and space in this model. And if we look at the condition in here, equation 20, that means the point mass will have one quantized amplitude. And every, the one point mass will only oscillate with one frequency and one, one amplitude. Th that's it. And this is what the nature of matter in, within this model that we have shown. So how does the, the, the particle travel along the time? If we use the, ampl uh, the quantized amplitude in time, we can write the oscillation in time in equation 21. But however, remember this oscillator has to remain in stationary in space. But if you look at this equation here, we notice that time actually still travels along a near time geodesic, just like what relativity is, 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 is predicting. If the vibrations cannot be observed with, with a clock that's sensitive enough to observe. So if we average out the cycle, matter still travel along a time-like geodesic, just like what we expect from relativity. And the time rate in here will be given in equation 22 in here. And if we took at the time rate, the average of this time rate of the particle is 1. It is bounded between 0 and 2. It never goes back to, to, to the past. Everything just moves forward in, in time. And it will be traveling along a near time like Judas. And when the Lorentz transforms to another frame, like we move the particle to another frame which is moving, we can, that particle will have oscillation in both time and space. And we can calculate this amplitude. This amplitude oscillation is not predicted by quantum theory. So it can be used to falsify the theory if it is not true. And if we take a look at an electron, the electron has like 10 to the power 20 uh, oscillation per second. And in the non relativity limit, you can see that amplitude actually is just the size of a nucleus. It's very small. But if we project the particle very fast, this oscillation will, the amplitude will increase. And you, you can see that it increases substantially when it is in the relativity limit. They are not predicted in quantum theory. So it could be used for the oscillation, or for te temporal uh, 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 oscillation. And so, so let us see how we can observe this, this oscillation. Now remember, the particle has oscillation time. And so it, the time rate is different. 
So in special relativity, there is something very similar. When the decay particle falling from the sky, like a muon, the decay rate of it will vary. And so in this case, it would be the same. If the oscillation of time is slow enough, the decay rate of a particle, of an unstable particle, will either slow down or faster. If someone can, can observe this from the clock, then it is something that will prove the, uh, this oscillation in time. Similarly, the oscillation in space that we, we just showed, it is something that is observable. It, it will affect the arrival time of a particle to certain location. And it will get back along a larger and larger when it is getting faster and faster. So it is another indirect way to, to observe this time oscillation. Now to skip a lot of these uh, junk in here, which we developed the, the quantum theory in, in the relativity limit, I will just lay out the, the, the results that we have. Now the constrained condition that we have given uh, previously, we can um, um, set up another constrained condition with this equals to n. n is the number of particles in the field, in the box. So there are number, n number of particles, they all oscillate in the proper time, and, but they are stationary in the box. And this has to be quantized, because we have a quantized field. And the energy of this quantized field will be equal to in here, which is the n number of particles with angular frequency omega inside a box in volume V. And we can go through all the, all, all, all the calculation and superpose the wave and then come up with the Hamiltonian equation. And if we look at this Hamiltonian equation, this is the exact form that we will get for a bosonic field. And then, typically, when we transform a classical field to a, a uh, quantum field, we can be, it can be done by a, a canonical quantization. So we promote everything, any observable, to a, an operator. And so the number of operators, NK, creation operator, the uh, uh, annihilation operator, they can all be promoted to an operators in here, which is in terms of the, the uh, proper time of the amplitude. And this Hamiltonian is uh, just showing that they are quantized oscillators with different uh, angular frequencies. This is the exact results that we get from a zero spin bosonic field. So, from this, by just assuming a symmetry in, with, with time and space in the, in the magnetic field, we can obtain a similar properties that we expect from, a, from quantum field theory. Now, we can easily uh, translate this into the Rondon relativistic limit, which is a more familiar form that we have in quantum mechanics. We can define a phase wave function in terms of the vibration in time and space is zero. And but we will have we will introduce a an arbitrary wave fact, I mean exponential factor in here, which uh, has a power, it's an arbitrary phase factor. And we'll show that this is not going to uh, change the overall un unobservable phase that we expect in the quantum uh, 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 wave function. Now this is another that form that we have simplified uh, for, for the wave function. And they have to be a solution for the Schrodinger equation. So, and then, and then the wave function, just like typically, we will get the proper time amplitude by, by multiplying with the complex conjugate. So, in the non relativistic uh, way, we can also obtain all the properties of a quantum um, mechanic, uh, quantum field in, in quantum mechanics. Now, we'll just go through very briefly why, why we think that time can be an operator. If we remember, Pauli suggests that time cannot be an operator. He come up with the, uh, the, the reason is that because the Hamiltonian uh, spectrum of the system has to be positive. While time can be taken as plus and minus sign, by this reasoning, he comes to the conclusion that it can, time cannot be a, an operator. And his reasoning I briefly just summarized in here, which he worked it out. And, and a lot of things, people think that it is a theory, but, but what I find, uh, what a lot of people suggest, actually it's just a suggestion by Pauli. It was never a theory that was, was adopted. And 
Uh, there are also other people using proper time as an operator. And you also run into the problem. The, the reason why is the conjugate momentum of this proper time is given in equation 39. It looks like a conjugate momentum the, for, 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 a, for momentum in, in the spatial direction. But if we look at this, this can have plus and minus sign. While if we look at the matter of mass, the mass of matter, they can be, it has to be bounded from the law. There's no way it can be plus and minus. And then furthermore, this conjugate momentum is continuous. And, but however, same thing, the mass of a matter, it's discrete. So, oh, they all run into the same kind of problem and come up to the conclusion that there is some issue that we cannot use time as a, a, an operator. But what we want to show in here, that time, actually in this model, can be an operator. I'm not sure if this can help in quantum correlation, but this will expand the mathematical formulation that we will have. Now, if we write the energy of the oscillator, we can see that this is very similar to the one that we have oscillation in space. You can see that the very first term is just the relative oscillation in time. The second one is the relative rate of oscillation. And they just look like exactly like what the oscillation in time. But now it is oscillation in, in, in time and not in space. Sorry, just on the subject of time. Uh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I think I no. start later. Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, we can sacrifice your question time if you want to go on for 10. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I'll make it quick. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. So, we'll just uh, skip it through and then uh, try to get. We, we can define a Q0 and P0, which is the uh, quantum momentum and then develop a, a commutation relation and an uncertainty relation in here, which looks like what we have in classical quantum mechanics. And we can see that these two are, looks like the, the operator for quantum oscillators. But however, now Q0 and P0 can be plus and minus. It can span from negative uh, infinity to negative infinity. So we do not have the same problem that, as what Pauli has suggested. And also, because this field, the energy, actually is not given by, it can be written in terms of the conjugate momentum, which is the square. It's always positive. So, or, and also this field has to be quantized. So we, the, the issues that we have discussed earlier with, with a proper time as an oscillator, it does not exist in here. So, how does this apply to quantum condition? I think that's the most important you, you, you would think in, in this, uh, uh, um, in this talk. So if we look at the, the, our brain, our brain is a macroscopic object. Everything that happens inside will naturally think that it is a classical field. And one of the important parts of cognition actually is to extract part of the information from a huge information that flows into the brain. Now, so the operations through an incomplete information process actually is very profitable in the system because it can have an advantage that it can increase the speed of, of the computations. And an observer might evolutionarily develop the ability to operate, operate with incomplete information in a quantum-like way. That's everyone, I think, in, in, in here is trying to develop. But however, the main difference between the quantum processing of information from the classical is that the former consistently can ignore a part of the information. But however, there is no easy way to adapt the quantum formulation in condition to extend that to a quantum probability beginning from a classical field. And it's important for us to understand how from a classical field inside the brain can be turned into a quantum field. And so that's come to what our mathematical formulation that we have presented so far. We, what we have done so far, we begin our formulation without specifying whether the matter field actually is quantized or classical. And the mathematical, the mathematics describing the time and the space oscillation can equally apply to a classical field. So in here, if you remember what we have previously describing the, the oscillation in time and space, they can be written as a classical field. So it can be used to describe something inside the brain, which is a classical field. And I will assume that this information uh, can represent, I mean, the, this oscillation somehow can represent what's happening in the brainwave 
in the brain, and also how the information are processed initially. And then we will apply a constraint that we have previously adopted with the amplitude will be constrained to certain quantized quantity. And this will signal the information loss in, in the brain. So we'll uh, consider a classical field in the brain, apply a constraint, then results in information loss, and then results with a, a quantum-like uh, uh, field description. So what our mathematical formulation may have an application in quantum cognition that describes something classical, information loss, and then the quantum-like uh, uh, field. And this summarizes what we have, result, uh, that we have talked about. Now, from a classical field in play, it will be a classical or field uh, uh, side that we have described earlier. Information loss will be equal to the, the constraint that we apply for the amplitude of the oscillation. Then it comes to a field that will have a quantum-like description. So, yeah, that summarizes my, my, my talk. <laughs> So this uh, the field uh, describing uh, something going on within the brain is supposed to be different from the field describing something within this cup or, or this hat or anything. I mean, what what is what is special about this field within the brain as ah. as compared to a piece of meat somewhere else? Well, we were trying to just do a mathematical model like uh, uh, some other people has been using that adapts the information that's initially coming to the brain is a classical field. And what's observed, like the, the, the head, that's something that could be, uh, or some human decision, it could be, it, it could be uh, uh, quantum-like. So, so we just try to... No, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not asking you about the perception of that. Uh -huh. I'm just saying, you know, something going on in my brain uh -huh. should be different from from this the same type of field that's that's happening within the head, uh -huh. right? So, and I was asking what was the difference because your your things, uh, you know, the, the, this this seems to be so general mm. that it should be equally applicable to any object in the world, right? So, uh -huh. what is special about the brain then? I didn't think of that. That's uh, <laughs> something that I'm trying to uh, set a, a mathematical formulation for that. And and actually, that's some. Uh, that's a very good question. That that, that to develop this this uh, the in to to interpret what these math mathematical formulations should be. I think that's a good point that has to take into consideration. How can you in empirically test your theories? Yeah, uh, I mean not not what not in the brain, but but if, I mean physically you can test uh, this theory. I mean if if because the, there's difference in time oscillation rate, mm -hmm. so we if we can observe the time rate inside an oscillation, mm -hmm. like if, if we have an unstable decaying particle, mm -hmm. because. As, as it goes, the decay rate is different, it varies. And so, or if there are oxidation in time, that decay rate will change. So that's something similar to what Einstein has been proposing for particles coming from the sky, from the muon coming to the sky, and then the decay rate, it will change with, the, with the, its uh, speed or, or gravitation field. So, so something similar to that. Very much. And we have time for one more question if there is one. Otherwise, we, we can move on to the last presentation of this year's Quantum Interactions Conference. Are there any, any other questions? Good. Yeah, thanks very much. So, our final presentation for this year is Language Geometry Using Random Indexing, which will be presented by Mandy Jenkins.
name is Aditya Joshi, and I'm, I guess, kind of representing myself and Johan Halset and Penti Finerva. And as was introduced, my or our project is called Language Geometry Using Random Indexing. And so I'm going to talk first about the idea of language recognition as a problem, then what random indexing is, and then how we apply it to then the idea of language recognition, but using this idea of creating a geometry in the space of languages. So language recognition is an interesting problem that's also very intuitive to understand. So suppose you hear someone speaking Spanish and you don't know Spanish, and you hear someone speaking French and you don't know French. There's something about the like, Frenchiness of the French and the Spanishiness of the Spanish that tells you that one is Spanish versus one is French. And what this idea or this problem is, is that there is some audio data that one receives and one is able to interpret, process, and realize that this data actually identifies the fact that some thing of this Spanishiness is Spanish and the other is French. And one can say this about many other different languages and it's true. The same thing is true about text of data, so or text of language, in that something about English can be identified with the fact that it kind of looks Englishy, and something about the Spanish looks Spanish. And so here now we're going to look at in this project using the text from the to text to represent language data to do this problem of language recognition. The unique part about this project is that we use random indexing. So I'm going to go in a lot of detail in talking about what random indexing is and how we applied it to this project, because that's what makes this whole thing so interesting. So specific to this project, or specific to the idea of encoding information for a language, random indexing is a unique way of using random projections to encode and retrieve data about some domain. So here in languages, what we did was we took each of these letters, so these are the Latin letters, A to Z, and randomly assigned them to a specific vector that was n-dimensional, 2k sparse, with elements that are minus 1, 0, and 1. And k is some value that's less than or equal to n divided by 2, and the elements in these vectors are minus 1 and 1. So k is chosen such that, or k is some fixed value, and what we're choosing, what we're choosing to show with the letter k is that there are k minus 1s within this vector and that there are k 1s within this vector. And what's interesting about this is that if you multiply a vector by itself, that is I'm going to say in fuzzy quotes that is sort of a uh, uh, multiplicative inverse of itself if you're talking about uh, point -wise, element wise multiplication of a vector. Uh, this space or this set of vectors is interesting within the larger set of, say, Rn, I'm going to say, is interesting because, because of this property of multiplicative inverses. And it's also interesting because this set of vectors, if you take one vector within this set and take another vector within this set, they're almost, they're very likely to be highly decorrelated. That is, if you take one vector and take another vector and take their dot product, they're, it's going to be very close to zero almost always. And so these two properties are very interesting and very, very useful. So as we proceed forward, we're going to exploit these properties in trying to encode the uh, language information, so that is the text data that will show this encoding. And here I'm going to use this notation, uh, kind of moving forward for the most for the most part. If there's a slide that doesn't have this, I'll explain it. But if there's a letter, so here the letter B is getting uh, assigned to this example example vector, and now this vector is going to be represented by x sub B. Oh, and one more thing to mention in this, there, there is a notion of, uh, there are two things to actually mention further from this, is that there is no real interpretation of what each of the coordinates are within this, that each 
it's, it's randomly assigned and randomly chosen as, as a vector, but this set of vectors is supposed to be interesting. And though there is no notion of what each element-wise entry means, there is still a notion of similarity or distance between each of, each of the vectors, and that's simply just the cosine angles between them. That is, if you take the dot product and normalize it. So within this subset of vectors, we can assign another operation on this space, and what we'll take, what I mean by another operation is we had the addition operation, adding by element-wise addition, and then we also have the multiplication oper operation, multiplying each entry by, uh, multiplying two vectors, as in multiplying each of the element-wise multiplication, and then you get another vector of the same size. In addition to that, you can do permutations. And what I mean by a permutation here is you fix a specific permutation on this space and you use that repeatedly in however many, however many times you want, but you fix that permutation. So in practicality, we almost always use, a, a, I guess it's called a rotation or a shuffle permutation. That is, if you have a vector, you shift each entry by one and then take the last one and move it forward. The uh, theoretically, you can say it's some arbitrary fixed permutation, but that, in implementation-wise, it turns out to be the most useful and the best one. Um, the reason why that turns out to be the best one is actually something I can mention from the previous slide. Is that when I said n dimensions here, I mean an intuitively large space. I mean some space of size 1,000, 5,000, or 10,000. So, something that's relatively large intuitively. And the reason I said that is now going back to here is that permutations here, if you do a shuffle permutation, then you have a thousand unique permutations. Or if in a thousand dimensional space, you have a thousand unique permutations if you do them over and over again. And that's something that's exploited in this explanation over here. So here, now, what, when I said that two, el two elements in this subset, so two vectors within the subs subset of vectors that I described before, are highly probably decorrelated. The same thing can be said about combinations or multiplication of certain vectors. So here I have v1 and v2, where v1 is a doubly permuted A, so rho represents a permutation, so doubly permuted A times a singly permuted B times a C, and the same thing for V2, but now C and V are two different things. They are very, very close to each other in terms of how they're kind of created, but if you go through the operations, the fact that uh, element-wise multiplication is commutative and uh, the uh, permutation is distributive uh, on this line, and the fact that uh, randomly chosen vectors are highly decorrelated makes it so that the distance between the two vectors is very close to zero, just exploiting the properties that I described before, where C is some normalization factor when you're doing um, kind of cosine angles as a distance measure. And so now we have permutations within this set of interesting vectors with addition and multiplication. And we also have them assigned to specific letters, so that's what makes it interesting. Now, using these building blocks, we can create what now I'll call language vectors. And here I'll describe the process by which we create language vectors. So. Here I have a window around STH, a three-letter window, and I want to create a vector that represents STH, but also encodes the properties that S is the first letter, T is the second letter, and H is the third letter. Now, I can use the properties I described before and the operations I described before to create a vector that represents exactly that by taking X of H, once permuted x of t, and twice permuted x of x. And multiplying all three of them, because of what I described before, I get a unique vector that now represents x sub s t h, which I'm the, a nice way to call it. Now, using this kind of 
method on every possible three-letter block, or in linguistics they call it a trigram, or n-gram with n equal to three. The trigram, you could do this for all of these trigrams within, let's say, this sentence, so it would be h-i-s, i-s space, s space, a, etc., etc. Add them all together, um, and the sum, as kind of described in the bottom over here, with equals being an assignment operator over there, the sum of all of this would then be what you'd represent as in, or what you'd call your x sub English vector. And so this is what you have as your language vector. A very simple, easy way to create a representation of English with the statistics of each letter embedded within one vector in itself. And English is not unique in that it has written text. So you can do this with any language that has text. And so what we did was we did exactly this on 21 different languages uh, for letters that did not have, or for languages that did not have the sp uh, original Latin letters, for example, German with its umlauts, we made a conversion so that it had some, some way to change it into something that has the original Latin letters, and, or the original 26 Latin letters that are in English. And then we created, using this process, exactly what would be a language vector for each of these 21 different languages. So I'm not going to go deep into this slide, but the implementation of this can actually, uh, the complexity of this process that we had described before can actually be simplified quite, uh, quite a bit, just kind of intuitively, in that uh, you can make the implementation very quick. I don't know if I should go into more detail on that, but uh, here n is the vector additions that are required, d are the number of permutations, and m are the number of letters within the text that you're, do, you're using to create the language vector. And you can simplify it by removing the number of permutations if you cleverly go through the text. It's, it's a lot more interesting to see if you actually look at the code that describes this. So what I described before was the process by which one could create language vectors using the simple process of language or random indexing. What I'm going to proceed to describe now with a bunch of nice looking graphs and tables is some interesting results that you can get from just looking at the space which we have created now using these vectors with random indexing that represent language because language has a lot of in or, uh, written text has a lot of interesting properties that are unique to language. So here is a graph which I'm going to say did not make the final paper because it proved something wrong in what we were trying to figure out. What this graph describes is, as the title says, the variance of cosine angles between vectors. What this means is that we took each of these language vectors that we had created and then measured the cosine angles between each of these language vectors and we got a number, created the distribution of them, and then looked at the variance of the distribution. The variance of the distribution we hope would describe whether if, if we were to test and see if we wanted to know what an unknown text language was, then the variance would best describe whether the clustering of the languages would maybe describe something about the distribution what the uh, unknown text was. Um, that was not the case, which I'll describe later, which you'll see with some numbers, but what this did show is something interesting about the variance, or uh, the distribution of the distance between language vectors as you increase and decrease that k parameter I described before, and increase and decrease the dimensionality of the space. So in a kind of nice looking way, you can see in this red over here, if you increase the dimensionality of the space and you decrease the k factor, which I'm going to call the sparsity factor, then you increase the variance of the, uh, of the, of the language vectors, which I guess is pretty cool. It worked out nicely. So 
before I continue, as, as the next slides are sort of going to repeat themselves in terms of what they describe, I wanted to kind of give you a heads up on what the actual um, Indo-European language family looks like, just, just to give you a kind of base knowledge if you haven't seen this before. So there's like a group of Slavic languages, Germanic languages, um, Indo-Iranian languages. So of the 21 languages that we chose, and chose to test and kind of look at, um, as, as you'll see uh, ahead, we did choose from uh, a lot of Germanic languages just because they were easier to find text from, but then we did choose uh, Greek and then there were some Slavic languages which we converted and uh, we, we tried to spread it out as much as we could based on what was available. So this is the first interesting result. The first, re this result is uh, the space of vectors that the space of language vectors that we had created using uh, sparse vectors, that is, it is a 10,000 dimensional space with k, this sparsity factor equal to 10, and trained on uh, text from each of these languages using Project Gutenberg. And this is a little bit hard to see, but the general idea is that similar languages sort of group together. It's not that great, it'll get better as we move on. But you can kind of see Germanic languages over here, at least I can, since I'm very close. You can see uh, Slavic languages over here, and uh, there's some random ones that don't really make sense over here, like Romanians kind of hanging out in the middle. What does the uh, scales mean? The scales are arbitrary. What this is is a projection onto a two-dimensional space, and it's using a fancier version of PCA. How much error is there? How much error is... In the projection? Are you projecting distances? Um, no, I'm not projecting. So what I did was, I, uh, when I mean a fancier version of PCA, what I mean is that I first did PCA and then I did a randomized projection, uh, a PCA on, a, on the first 100 dimensions and then a uh, two-dimensional projection using what is called TSNE. It's kind of a randomized version of uh, a stochastic, I guess it would be called a stochastic projection onto a two-dimensional space. I'm not really sure how to describe it any further than that, though. And so, here now what we did was we described, or we did the same projection onto a two-dimensional space using dense vectors. And what that means, it's a ten-dimensional space, but with k equals to five, uh, five, five thousand. And 5,000 is the largest k that you can get with a 10,000 dimensional space. And just by looking from afar, the clustering is much better. And from looking up close, the clustering actually makes sense in that the Germanic languages are kind of hanging out over here and the Slavic languages are over here and the Romance languages are over there. And the other kind of not quite as related to the other ones are sort of in the middle. And now here, this is another set of language, cluster, or language clustering that we had done now, but the uh, difference in this and the other previous one that I had said before is that instead of being trained on some random text from Project Gutenberg, this is actually using what was called the Rorschach's corpus. Uh, provided by University of Leipzig. And what is interesting about this corpus is that it has modern language. Project Gutenberg is free text that's provided historically that has gone through its whatever copyright license and then you can sort of receive it afterwards. Uh, this Warshats corpus is actually a news crawl data. So what, they, what this data was created from was modern news data that, and random sentences from this news data that was put together and then uh, easily accessible as text data. And so this data is, the text data that this was trained on is very modern, so it's between uh, uh, 2010 to 2014 that the news data this, this was created for. And so using this new modern data, this, this clustering on sparse vectors is better, but with dense vectors it is still much, much better, and it actually makes much, much more sense if you actually look at the um, lettering. And so now, 
kind of going on to the meat of what I was describing before, we created a detection test to see how accurate these actual language vectors were rather than just looking at the space which we had created with the language vectors. And so using this news call data that, I had, that we had used to create the vectors, we now held them and stored that data as the text, uh, the language vectors that we had described, and then tested these on random sentences from uh, the corpus called the Europarl car corpus. And what this has is a thousand sentences for each of the languages that we had described, that, that uh, we had tested on before. And they were all about eight to 10 words, and each word was something like between uh, three to eight characters I wanted to describe. So it's normal size sentences, and they are used to detect what language each text was. And the way that this was done is that given a language vector, what you could say is that unknown vector for some unknown text, you could use that previous method to uh, encode it into the high dimensional vector space and then just do a cosine angle a similarity test between all the other languages and see which one is closest. That would be the most obvious way to do so and we did that. And so here's one table which I'm not going to dwell on, but here is using sparse vectors, so k equals 100 in, ten, in a 10,000 dimensional space. And what you see is that clusters or blocks or trigrams, I was kind of inconsistent in this presentation, uh, of size 1 and 2 work best in terms of language detection. But as I described before, the variance of the language vectors is kind of random. and so it did not really tell you anything. And here when I say unordered versus ordered clusters, ordered clusters means STH is different from, say, SHT. Unordered means that they're the same. And here is the same result on dense vectors. And this is where it got very interesting when we pursued the result, is that for clusters of size 3 and 4, you can get a language accuracy of about 96%. That is for the thousand sentences for each of the languages. On average, it's about a 96% accuracy. And to show that result in a little more detail, here is a beautiful table which describes at the top what the actual language of a specified sentence is and then on the side in each of the rows what the guess language of a text is. And what this interestingly shows is, say for example, Spanish. So Spanish over here was guessed 946 times on the Spanish sentences that it was given. But of that, the ones that were wrong, 30 of them were actually in Portuguese. So the clustering was very, very accurate in terms of guessing what is a very similar language and what is not even in the errors that it was making. And that is true with pretty much all the other languages. There, like, there are a couple weird errors in there, but for the most part it makes sense. And so I don't think I'll have that much time to talk about this, but this was an interesting thing that you can actually come from just uh, exploiting the properties that were kind of uh, described initially on creating the space is that when you have a language vector, say English for example, you can just use the properties of multiplication or element-wise multiplication and the multiplicative inverse thing I in quotes described before to ask the question, what is the most common letter that comes after the letters TH? And so uh, if you do that actually computationally with uh, trigrams in the, English vector, in the English vector, just with multiplication alone, you can extract out that E comes out after most often. And just to review, that's just from, if you, you could do it with STH over here, if you uh, have S and T over here, you could do a multiplication here to take out S or to take out S by doing a double permuted S multiplied by itself, double permuted T multiplied by itself, and get just H alone, and that's also true within the sum of itself over there. And so there's a bunch of future work that's possible 
Uh, for example, going from text data to speech data, which is uh, incredibly difficult, but it sounds awesome. There is uh, also different ways of encoding sequential information. For example, the idea of history to history vectors. That is um, having some way of saying where within the overall text you are, rather than just talking about specific chunks of text and uh, looking at clusters that are actually words rather than just random sequences of letters. And a bunch of other stuff if you think about it and that have not written. That's all. Okay, so we have some time for questions. So first hand up. Yeah, really cool talk. Um, I was wondering, in the beginning you said when you were talking about German, that had a problem because you have letters in the German. Yeah. And then you want to get rid of it because you want to get rid of 26 letters. Yeah. Which sounded to me a bit weird because I don't speak German, but I recognize German because there are yeah. everywhere. Yeah. So I guess you're not interested in the orthographical sense of the text or just the order of, of, of the letters because you seem to dismiss some vital so, information how I recognize language. Yeah, so I'll say that it is. I think of it the same way because if I look at, I'll, I'll say intuitively, if I look at German, I will recognize it because of its umlauts and, and a couple other things. But if you want to have, there are two ways to solve that problem then when you're doing it this way. We did it the simpler, I guess relatively simpler way. One is map, so say you have O umlaut. One way is to map it to the standard way of mapping it to just the letters, which is O, E. And then if you have O, E and then have that as just a way to represent it, then kind of done. Another way to do that would be to say, instead of just having the Latin letters, you can add another letter within what you have and then saying, okay, that's mapped to another letter, or mapped to another vector, and then because of the properties that I had described before, it, it works out nicely because it's a high dimensional space. You would expect better results because, because it makes it easier. Like, yeah, so uh, to kind of expand on that, another, another thing that we were looking at which I haven't gone much further into is if you add a space as another vector, as another letter, that improves a lot of things significantly, and that makes sense if you have more vectors to distinguish what each text has, then it, it'll work out better. <laughs> make, it, make it even easier to recognize German because they don't, they, they don't have so many spaces. <laughs> <laughs> What is the use for, for this? What is what, for what purpose do you use this platform? So uh, the reason this is useful is that compared to other language recognition, uh, I guess algorithms that exist, this is both much faster and much much less storage. So, for example, creating a language vector representation of English on my computer, it takes about five to eight minutes, and it takes almost no storage at all. If you compare it to, uh, for example, Google has what was called, I think, the Chromium language detector. That is a pretty large download for one, so that takes a long time, depending on your internet. Then it also is, um, because it has so much data, it's relatively slow on how it does the computation, though arguably it has more information within it. So that's, that's and that, that's the uh, kind of boring NLP evaluation question I was uh, about to ask. I presume this is uh, like faster and more computationally efficient and then, you know, let's say you, you, know, you particularly wanted to write an ACL paper or something like that, the first thing people are going to ask is, okay, how does it compare to the precision and recall of uh, like an n-gram model or something like that? Uh, do, you have, do you have a sense of that? Do you want um, I sense don't of remember the numbers. I do have something written somewhere that does describe that. Um, compared to, I'll, I'll pick on the Chromium language detector I said before, it has about the same accuracy as we had before on um, the language detection. Mm -hmm. So that was what also this yeah. surprised us crazily when we saw that. That's surprising. And for the sake of like experimental reproducibility, yeah. I prefer to hear a result of just a relatively simple technique like like uh, and like, like yeah character yeah, so, modeling. Um, I don't remember 
I, I can't say, I don't remember right. what the engram stuff looked like. Um, yeah. Have you run those experiments? Yes, yes. We had. The, co the code is available on, uh, on our uh, the GitHub for all of this stuff. And the link for that is, I think, somewhere on the paper. So. But are those results in the paper? Um, I don't remember. I can't say. It's time for final revision. Then, so. um, <laughs> I, I want to ask a question. So, yeah. the performance improved as your vectors got more dense, right? Is that it? That was a surprise. It was a surprise. That was a surprise. Wouldn't that be a, a sort of fairly predictable consequence of multiplying many, many zeros together? As a so, <laughs> so, we realized that as we were making larger and larger clusters, that that's just a thing that intuitively happens when you multiply. Just we thought that the separation of having uh, sparse vectors would allow for better separability yeah. on the vectors, but I didn't realize. Or no, actually, I think uh, Lance, Lance in Australia had a way of um, doing something like the multiplication that would work with sparse vectors, right? where I think he was combining the indexes of the non-zero values instead of combining the values themselves. I'd have to reread the paper, but it seemed to me at the time that it was a way that you could maintain the performance that you get from the sparse vectors and have a sort of multiplication that isn't degenerate when you have many zeros as opposed to non-zero values. But it wasn't reversible, so you would be able to get the interest off to the TH back. And I think you'd probably be better if you put them in to speak about Lux's this model. But he, he did some, some sort of convolution with the indexes of the sparse vectors. Right? Yeah, yeah, it was a way. It was a way back. Very yeah. valuable the details. Yeah. Uh, Last line's got many things. Right. <laughs> okay. Are there any further questions? Or we could move to a coffee break. Coffee break before the final discussion. That's what mm. the next. Yeah. And it says the final discussion is like four o'clock. Oh, actually, good. actually, I have something to say about that. Uh, I think that uh, Federico was just noticing that on the program. Uh, I think that there was an oscillation in time here in the first talk and uh, the third talk. Uh, so there is a 30 minutes missing. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> you get older and then time goes by. So, um, that said, uh, dynamic variable. Yes, <laughs> so my proposal is that uh, um, since we have like a general discussion right after the coffee break, which is by the way available for you guys to do, what we could do is we have an unreasonable amount of time here for also the best in papers awards. And it seems very formal, it seems like we have awards to give to students, but we actually don't. Uh, <laughs> it, it's more like that, well, good job kind of thing, right? <laughs> um, so. Uh, um, my proposal is just for us to uh, 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 just recognize the uh, uh, papers that were awarded. We had like excellent papers being submitted uh, this year. Uh, we had a lot of uh, papers written by students and uh, postdocs and uh, people applying for the awards, so it was uh, very competitive. And our initial idea was to just have one student paper award, but uh, we got so many good uh, uh, applicants that we ended up uh, having two. So it's a pleasure for me to uh, let you guys know that uh, the actual paper that you guys just saw of, of Adidia and uh, Adidia Joshi and uh, Johan Hausseth, uh, they got the uh, best student award in the category, student paper award in the category of undergraduate and graduate students. If I understand it correctly, you did it when you're an undergraduate student at uh, UC Berkeley, right? Yeah. Are you still an undergraduate student? No, just graduated last year. Oh, well, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the other one was uh, Ru Wang's uh, uh, Zhang, sorry, Z Ru Zhang, yeah. another Ru Zhang. Ru Zhang's uh, paper uh, that you guys saw on testing contextual and psychophysical systems of high ranks. And uh, that was for the category of a postdoc uh, paper. <laughs> But, uh, congratulations to the uh, and, uh, I hope that uh, the QI conference keeps that uh, uh, sort of like uh, tradition of giving awards to best student papers because it's a good way to uh, attract also uh, younger people with uh, new ideas to come to our conference. Will you have a you know, live something? Yes, I'll, 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 I'll see if we can do that. 
I'll email you back. So for the closing yeah. discussion, can I suggest that we get back together in, say, 20 minutes at sure. half, half past three? Yeah. Sure. Oh, and uh, for those of you who are not staying for the general discussion, thanks for coming. It was a great conference. I hope you guys enjoyed as much as I did. Yeah, I think that's very nice.